Welcome back to yeah. Rebelthon, everyone. I have three wonderful swordsmen with me today. We have Nick Harrison, who is a member out of Falcon Base in British Columbia. And joining us from down in Australia, we have Bob Brown and Aiden Stenke. Right? <laughs> Steinke. <laughs> Steinke. Okay, Steinke, who were two Jedi extras on Attack of the Clones and are both Master Kendo, uh, Kendoka. Is that what it's at the term? Uh, I <laughs> teach Jodo and Bob teaches the Ido. Uh, okay. But you're the, from the Kendo, Kendo Club. The has many right. different weapons. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, the, the Sydney Kendo Club is where many extras were brought from for Attack of the Clones. So they are here. I myself am a foil fencer and I've done a bit of Subacto, but Nick Harrison is going to be asking the majority of questions here since he is a professional stunt coordinator. So thanks for being with us, everybody. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and yes. also too, uh, thank you for keeping everything on track because talking to other fight people, I can easily go completely off onto tangents and things that only five people might know and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, but this is great. So let's start off with this. First of all, really uh, we've had some a little bit of a brief conversation before we've started here and it already seems like this is gonna be a fun interview. Um, but just to start off, Robert and Aiden, if you could just um, share with us a little bit about who you are in terms of the Star Wars world and what you did and then we'll come back and we'll talk a bit about, I wanna find out more about your costuming and about your fight techniques and some theories and thoughts about different types of sword play and we'll just see where it goes. I'm sure Catherine might have some great things to throw in there as well. So we're just gonna keep this nice and loose. But to start off with um, both of you, tell us a bit about yourselves. Uh, you're down in Australia and I just wanna know about what, what, what you did, who you played, uh, how the experience was. And of course I might, and Catherine might just jump in and ask questions along the way. I'll go first cause mine's shorter. Uh, yes, <laughs> so I am, uh, or I was, sorry, Star Dan Eakin. Uh, Clatoonian Jedi who died on Geonosis. You can see that in the Doreen Kindersley Encyclopedia, whatever. Uh, I got the name after being an extra when they got in touch with us just wanting to create some names to uh, populate their um, articles on the uh, arena. So, um, and uh, so uh, that was that was a uh, bonus. But uh, yeah, so I was one of a handful, uh, I think three Clatoonians. We had rubber heads, uh, rubber, yes, uh, latex. Oh, yeah, we had wear latex masks uh, and um, and three and giant three fingered gloves, which made handling the really skinny lightsaber props, uh, the luminous pink for um, stroboscoping, uh, really difficult. Um, and we were uh, uh, somewhat interchangeable. We were actually identical and they, and, uh, and, uh, they kept mixing up who was doing what. But, uh, and so, uh, but uh, uh, we're from, I and Bob are from the Wollongong Kendo Club and we were Kendo players at the time. And, um, and one day, we got a call from the Sydney Kendo Club saying they were that uh, Nick Gillard was uh, going to come and uh, look for uh, wanted was calling for volunteers to come and try out to be extras in the Star Wars movie. And so Sydney put a call out to all to uh, Wollongong's the next city south. We're 50 miles south. And uh, so myself and Bob trundled up to help pad out the numbers. And uh, we got through the. Uh, tests at Gladesville uh, no uh, Ro uh, yeah. Gladesville I think it was um, and uh, then went off to Fox Studio for a couple of days of uh, green screen work um, you can actually see the costume I was in if you had the original ni ni 2002 DVD uh, uh, because uh, it uh, had uh, pictures of us it's labeled a gaggle of Jedi's. I'll move to a uh, uh, a uh, less active cap room. Yeah, a gaggle of Jedi's relaxing, <laughs> and so you can see both Bob and myself in our brown uniforms. But uh, and uh, wandering around the set was an awesome amount of fun, 
Uh, we saw the uh, Jedi starfighters hiding inside uh, one of the other um, studios waiting for something and uh, what have you. But yeah, I'll hand over to Bob now. Oh, hello. Uh, my name's Bob. Uh, I'm a former academic at the university that Aiden runs. Um, <laughs> I'm no longer one of those. I'm now a failed <laughs> lawyer. Um, but yes, no, that, that's entirely right. We, we were contacted by our friends at the Sydney Kendo Club. Uh, we turned up there. Most people had had measurements taken and there were costumes ready. They had mysteriously lost mine. Um, I think they actually ordered me to shave the beard off. I wasn't always this grey. And they were worried that from a, you know, a reasonable distance, uh, there could be some visual confusion between myself and one of the named characters. Can't think which one. Might have been, might have been Mace Windu. And, um, <laughs> and I refused to shave my beard off. I trimmed it right down, but I refused to take it off altogether. So they mysteriously didn't have a costume for me. So I got the last thing on the rack. Um, those who are familiar with Jedi costumes, there's a sort of an undershirt. There's a, a sort of a cross piece, uh, sort of big shoulder paddy affair. A cummerbund goes around that and then a leather belt around the cummerbund. And then, of course, the big monastic robe that goes over the whole lot with the baggy sleeves and the hood. Mm. My costume was unusual. The big monastic robe with the hood was actually my middle layer. So the cummerbund went around that and the, and the brown belt went around that. So that was actually both my middle and my outermost robe. So it was quite unique. Uh, it didn't look like anyone else. I came out looking like a Franciscan monk more than anything else. <laughs> yeah. um, so in and my it wasn't, in my tiny it wasn't like it wasn't like Keanu Mundi's either because we established no, 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 that before this. Because when you started saying that, I was like, oh yeah, Keanu Mundi. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Full length and and fully clothed, uh, fully closed. So and mm. then almost, and then almost, the belt around it. Correct. Yes. Yeah. The, the cummerbund, the big the big wrapping. Yeah. The, the which obi. Is, yeah, well, I was going to say Obi because that, yeah. that reminds me of some other character. But um, <laughs> uh, so it was an unusual costume in that regard. And the problem, one of the problems with that was, A, it was very hot and I couldn't take it off. Other people could take their outer robes off. Secondly, they actually had people occasionally removing their outer robe because usually there's a two-tone, you know, light and dark or dark and light. And by taking their outer robes off, they could get people to look like other people. So they made it look like there were twice as many of us by saying, okay, now we're going to do a robes off shot. And of course I couldn't take my robe off because it was my costume. So I only got to be in half as many shots as a result, <laughs> which was a bit of a shame. Um, but yeah, no, it was very interesting. I, I, I actually was very naughty and wandered into another studio and got to walk around the, uh, the Jedi ether Sprite fighter, uh, yes. which, was a, which was a bit of a, a bit of a coup. Cause I, I used to write technical, commentary websites for Star Wars. Uh, uh, Dr. Curtis Saxton was a very dear friend of mine at the time. And he and I sort of had uh, complimentary dueling websites. And mm. uh, so that was a bit of a scoop. And also the uh, Geonosian Solar Sailor, Count Dooku's ship. Oh, yes. That's, act that's actually the scene of the, you know, the penultimate fight with uh, you know, Dooku and and uh, and a little plushy Yoda on a string that was jiggled around and almost looked like a fight. Um, so, and it was interesting because a lot of the detail of those ships were not on the actual sets. So there was CG stuff being live mapped. Must have been because there were things that just mm. weren't physically there. It was rather interesting. Um, Probably the highlight for me was actually getting to talk with Ben Burt, who was the second unit director. Uh, and they had just brought out this amazing new camera technology. Oh, yeah, time. he showed us the Sony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I actually got to, because I was, I was doing some research in, in uh, IT at the time and I was looking into that stuff. And so he actually let me into the camera tent and I got to peer through the, you know, the, the Uber 4K amazing, you know, uh, high res stuff that was world breaking at the time. So, yeah, that was interesting. Sorry, what was your next question? <laughs> oh, this is fascinating to hear that. I'm curious um, with your costume, uh, and again, uh, this is just for people out there that are, you know, the costume Jedi. Uh, your belt, how did it go? Uh, did, did it uh, connect in the back? Yes. Um, 
the the obi, the the cummerbund, the wrapping. Uh, my own personal costume is, of course, four meters of material that I wrap around. The costume ones, no, they're set, they're locked in place. With the folds, are all carefully stitched and ironed into place and starched, and mm. basically that they, they break away at the back and they velcro at the back. Um, the belt, I have a replica belt that I acquired some years later. It's as near as damn it identical. Uh, and the way it works is you would, you, would think, you would think that it buckles at the front there. It does not. At the back, rather, I don't know if the, the light will catch. There's a sort of a, looks like a pouch, but it is actually just a, a Velcro arrangement. So, so they, they basically just Velcro at the back, and of course it's adjustable for girth, shall we say? Yeah. So and the makeup it, people just put our heads on, yeah. well, or and then and then had us stand there and dressed us, and Velcro pulled everything tight. Now, there's another interesting thing. There's a little dirty trick that they were doing. Uh, there's a like a little. I don't know. Um, there must be a name for it. I don't know. I'm not into dressmaking, but a sort of a, a stapler gun that fires a little plastic tag. You know when you buy a pair of socks and they're tagged together? Yeah. So uh, uh, they would just come up and go bang and, and, and fire this little tag. So they'd, they'd get you all stitched in and then they'd come along and go bang, 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 and shoot these little tags in. And that's what's hold, basically holding you together. And then just go, Rip, you know, when you're done. Um, well, I think they cut them. Is that what holds the tabards on? The Yes. Okay. Oh, we use Velcro. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, if you look at uh, one of the more recent movies, name of which escapes me because they were so memorable, um, there's a bit where Skywalker throws his hood back and he's wearing a pale grey outer robe at Brarasca, as memory serves. And if you look carefully, the, the whole costume sort of pulls oddly on his undershirt as he yeah. does so. Yeah. It, it will have been pinned together in that way. Yeah. Well, it's, with the hood up, it would have hung beautifully. And since they've done that, that wasn't how it was pinned on. And, and so it looks very odd. It's hilarious because catch- a friend of mine went round and round with that costume, trying to figure out how the ro- that outer robe stays on him because it has no arms. Yeah. And basically, ev- eventually, stapled it in. Yeah, yeah. eventually we just safety <laughs> pinned it on him for that, that night. And then when, you know, at the end of the movie, like that dramatic reveal for me, like it was like just a little bit ruined. Cause like, I'm looking at like how it's like yanking on that. And I'm just like, man, it's just like sewn to the tabards. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, we were like trying to figure out all this stuff and no. <laughs> and <laughs> anyone just... who's been to a, to a university graduation and had a hood, you know, it comes out here and there's yes. often a little tag, yeah. right? And or a little the loop. Night, that's sort of riding up here. Like, so it's exactly that sort of experience. As I yes. <laughs> it, it sort of shows, like, again, for people that, that cosplay this, like when you're working on a film set, everyone's just grabbing what works in the moment. So I've had mm. things on sets where it's been double-sided uh, glue tape to, yeah. you know, um, someone sewing something in immediately. And you're thinking, wow, this is... Oh, um, and speaking yeah. of corners, on these belts, um, at the, to- the, the, the prequel era uh, belts, they weren't just this. They had, you know, sort of like little utility belt pouches and things like that, which are numerous photo references are available. But one thing that caught my eye was a pouch that, that sort of clicked on. And they had a whole box of these. They were just sort of handing them out randomly. Here, you have one, you have two. I don't think I've got one. Uh, and I recognised them instantly. They were, could they, because I used to work in a toy store, they were actually a toy replica of the utility pouch of a Michael Keaton Batman costume. So it's actually the Batman utility pouch. The pouch itself was a little plastic thing with a hook on the back that, that you know, kiddies could wear on their dress ups. And it had just been slightly resprayed because, of course, the Keaton stuff was black. So they were resprayed, you know, tan and brown or what have you. But that's exactly what they were. They're a little hard plastic shell Batman utility pouch. This this might actually lead into why, you know, it's the resin pouches and not leather for a lot of these things. So that just really makes a lot of sense. Now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not were. sure yeah. that we knew that before, Nick. I don't like think we did. No. So you've you've <laughs> just shed some light on some stuff. There's gonna be some eBay. Hunting yeah, there'll be now. some eBay sales now. <laughs> Who's a Kit Fisto fan? I, I had lunch with Kit Fisto. 
<laughs> and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, this little Chinese vegetable called a bok choy. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar. Mm. It's a little sort of sort of a spinachy kind of thing, you know. But when they're steamed, they turn the most beautiful luminescent green, but they're also very soft. And he was sitting there in his full tentacle makeup in, in the crew tent. And he stuck <laughs> his fork into a bok choy and picked it up. And I sort of went, oh, one of your younglings. Because it looks just exactly like... And so whoever it was wearing that costume, and I do not know if it was the main actor or the second unit actor, you know, because it could easily have been a stand-in in the same costume. I don't know. But whoever it was was just absolutely wonderful. Took that and ran with it and sort of held up the, the, the this dribbling little bok choy on the end of a fork and was going, don't eat me, don't eat me. Ah. <laughs> this whole pantomime fight, which the, the whole crew tent just erupted. It was just lovely. It's probably the best memory I had of the experience. Oh my it's goodness! Got nothing to do with costumes, does it? No, but if you want to play Kit Festo, <laughs> yeah, bok choy. Get some bok yes. choy and steam it. Yes. Yeah. That's, See the that's the official. That's the official word from the Jedi kids. Eat your bok choy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Many years ago, I did. A, I had this like comedy TV show, and one of the things we did for, I think it was for Attack of the Clones, um, we were sent to go out to the lineups. And I had, at that point, I had put together my very first Star Wars costume, which was a Stormtrooper costume, well before I was even involved in any of the costuming groups. And uh, my friend, Mike Roberts, who's passed away now, he was such a funny comedian. He painted his face green and he got two leaves of lettuce and he just uh, had them wrapped around his head, sticking out. And he was Yoda. <laughs> and it was just <laughs> perfect. And we were going around. I really want to find that clip of us because it was just so funny and to engage him with the fans. And he was trying to do Yoda stuff with these pieces of lettuce hanging off of his ears. Anyway, that just reminds me of that with your bok choy. <laughs> so really fascinating already. This is exciting. So, okay. Um, you're, uh, you know, you're martial artists. You've been called to this thing. You're on set. Um, tell us a little bit about the fight experience. Like how much of the fights were, did you find? And I find this often as a fight director myself. Um, when I'm uh, working with a group of people that are what we would call special skills extras when we're working and we have our stunt people as well, oftentimes I, I will make sure I know what the people are doing and I'll just ask them, so, hey, you know, maybe um, we need to fill this space. Can you do sort of like um, either like a peri or a post exercise or, you know, just, a, you know, a little bit of Kiri Kayashi or something like this, just to kind of have a bit of back and forth, just in the background. Um, if it's more important, I will put together something or I'll ask them what they feel comfortable doing within the space. And again, working on their own, um, off of their own sort of skill and comfort levels. So um, I just wanna, I'm just curious, uh, or, or I'll have a fully scripted notation that I'll give them, you know, depending on what the camera and the director wants. What is your experience with the with the fights in, in, in the movie that you found? This one was had? a bit, there were two different sorts of things because there, if you remember the way it originally was released as opposed to the current Blu-ray, which uh, it, there were all those tiny, there were all little tiny figures fighting, um, mm -hmm. which were cloned. Uh, yeah, so early CGI cloning of whatever is to make that they just had us all spread out across the uh, whole stage area, which was pretty big, uh, the whole uh, blue screen area, and there were di uh, pictures of flying. Well, they didn't tell us what they were. Life-size cardboard cutouts of Geonosians and yes, war drawings. Yes, it turns out they were life-size cardboard cutouts of Geonosians. But what it looked like was they were drawings of insects uh, up a, sort of like about head height uh, around the wall. And they said, uh, you're fighting flying these, so just, and just do it. And so uh, there was no ins instruction beyond that for that bit. They just wanted the 30 odd of us to wave swords in the uh, wave our. So for that, we we're using the pink skinny handle um, full length lightsaber uh, mm. replicant um, and just fighting off things in the air. And so people were doing all of the proverbial uh, and and uh, and and other Jedi esque actions because we had no shame, uh, or uh, or actual sword actions, whatever. But uh, but and because they're also small, you can't. It really yeah. Whereas um, 
went on, I was killed by the sonic cannon or whatever it was. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they, they had a, yeah, he, he, he actually was there. Um, um, yeah, we had to be saying, okay, jump in the air and fall down, jump on the, was, yeah, there's no sword fighting because we were being killed by explosives. <laughs> There, there actually wasn't much sword fighting uh, in the Battle of Geonosis because it was gun versus uh, lightsaber. And mm. um, so, uh, so it's more blocking and um, slashing. Uh, but, but yeah, and, and uh, so for the being killed and exploded, we were given just the short handle, no, ex no bar, uh, no blade uh, to hold and leap in the air and throw self on ground and, uh, and, uh, whatever else. Um, yeah. So Bob, on the other hand, um, I'm not sure how he, what his, yes, cause he was in the other side of the building. Uh, remarkably less experience even than that. I got the, you know, you will all stand socially distanced. It was very, very, uh, you know, force <laughs> forward sighted of them back in 2000. Um, <laughs> and, and wave at baddies. Uh, the, so there, there was zero choreography. There, there was no demonstration of what was being required. They simply relied on the fact that we were all, uh, I think we were all Dan Grade at least. I think. Yeah, he, because they uh, vetted us. That's but, right, yeah. yeah. So, so everyone was at uh, least, I think previously. we were third Dan or second or third Dan or something at the time, I can't remember. But, um, yeah. And uh, Kendo second Dan, I think I was third Dan EI at the time, mm. I can't remember. And um, so everyone had, you know, everyone could hold a shinai. Everyone could hold something by vaguely lightsaber shaped. Everyone knew, you know, some postures. Uh, everyone could do, you know, a cut or two or three. And basically most of us just sort of stood around doing that. And then we sort of, as, as, as it got more and more boring, we, we started getting a bit sillier and, and, you know, sort of twirly things started coming in and, uh, whatever, but it made little difference because, as Aiden says, almost everything we did ended up as a as a two pixel high squiggle in the background of the Genosia scene. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't uh, really rate in terms of screen presence, but it was a hell of an experience. It was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find uh, it's interesting with the prequels. Uh, I mean, originally my um, my love of Star Wars came from watching the original trilogy and then growing from that. And, and as a martial artist, and I wanted to ask you about this as well, because uh, I have this conversation with people that are not martial artists. And we get into this sort of a, a conversation sometimes about the functionality of the sword play or, you know, the how accurate or how precise or how um, effective it would be. And, you know, as a person that works in film and television, a lot of the times I know the camera wants something to fill the screen and, you know, spinning is fantastic because it's visceral and it's exciting. But then as a martial artist, I'm always, yeah, exactly. And as a martial artist, I always look at that and there's always a part of me that's just like, oh, I could just ski or I could just, you know, thrust in and that would be the end of it. The fight director of the prequel series in an interview uh, has said that he's encountered numerous commentaries after the fact of, oh, but you could, and oh, but you could. And his answer is essentially, it's a movie, it's fantasy. <laughs> and hey, look, hey, that, that's legit. But, you know, I mean, as you say, it's fill the screen with light and noise. And, and frankly, the lightsaber is the best theatrical sword ever. Right. It's oh, easily yeah, because tracked, it, you know, motion catches, blur and sound yeah, and Doppler. It's beautiful. But, but in terms of how it really works, the single biggest problem in my mind is that it has never been settled the physical properties of the weapon, okay? <laughs> because, no, seriously, I mean, consider it's, you know, it's a flashlight, right? If you wave a mag light around, what's to stop you just doing this, right? <laughs> I, I don't believe it is a massless blade. I honestly mm. don't. Uh, I... Mm. I my, my person, the, the way I rationalised this back on my website in the day, with the help of a lot of people with a lot of scientific uh, theories and knowledge and PhDs and all the rest of it, was that we believed that the blade was like a, a frozen blaster bolt. Imagine a, a blaster bolt coming out, but it stops and stays there. 
right? And and so it was essentially contained in some sort of a magnetic uh, bottle of some sort. And I theorized that if this bottle spun at, you know, near uh, luminal speeds, then even the tiniest amount of mass would have a massive gyroscopic effect. Mm. If you is right, so if you've ever had a gyroscope and you try and move it off center, there's resistance. Okay, so if you had a spinning blade, even made of spinning plasma, there's a uh, inertia. There's there's virtual mm. mass, and if you mm. look at the way they move them, they don't they don't move them like a like a flashlight. You know, oh, look over there, look over here. Oh, look, what's that? Oh, no, they don't do that. They move them like bloody broadswords. Well, so to my mind, there, there must be. So, if you theorize a model, whether it's the model I just described or whatever, you might say, no, they're like a flashlight. But whatever it is, you need to have made that decision. You need to have based your, your, your fictional martial art on the physical characteristics that you're acting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can't build the real thing, but you need to know what the real thing should have been like and then design your martial art around that. And then right. train your actors in that. And that was what we loved about A New Hope, as it now is. The, the, it was so internally consistent. Yes. Right. The Everyone criticises that first ever fight, and, and that first ever fight is real swordsmanship. I'm yes. sorry. It's real swordsmanship. I, it's I superb. completely agree with you on that. Because that whole mm-hmm. idea, again, as spending years you know, doing sword work, there's something exciting about that tension before the move. And often too, with mm. sword people, once the sword is drawn or the blade is, you know, or the blade is ignited, mm. the fight is already decided. When you've made that decision, right? When we go back to the Japanese, you know, philosophies about, about weaponry, once that blade is exposed, it is going to be used. And, and so I always found that tension between Vader and Obi-Wan very interesting because there's so much more going on between them as to them just talking. And you can see it in the slight movement of the hands and just that sort of tension. Like every time that I fight, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a tournament, I and love that are, feeling. Well, know? there's real techniques in there. There's a moment where Vader is doing two or three mm. thrusts yes. and Kenobi does a winding block. You know, yes. you're, you're a kendo instructor, Nick, you know, you know that's in kendo kata. Oh, definitely. And it's you know, so and it's so effective. Move. Right. And once you get into that, once you get into the zone, it gets dangerous, right? So you hear it's mm. okay, but once you get into here, something's gonna happen. Now there's another there's another thing to consider about different types of sword, and that is where are their balance points, right? 99.9% yes. of all swords, their balance point is a little ahead of the hilt. That's okay, right. So a couple of inches up off the blade in almost yeah. all swords. But that doesn't mean they're all moved in that way, okay? No. As you'd know, kendo moves the tip in small, m- relatively small movements, fighting for centre and then seeing an opening and right. plays with the small fingers because they're the That's fingers right. that aren't involved in the archery the glove. Speed fingers or these trigger the fingers. Yeah. These are your yeah. three fingers. So when you run out of arrows, you can use your sword. But Western, you know, uh, 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 Dry whiskey, right? Dry whiskey, sorry, it's it's the front fingers, right? Um, And a Chinese gen, a straight sword, okay, Mm -hmm. they rotate that around a midpoint halfway up the blade, okay? So so a rapier, you rotate around the point, okay? You move the hilt and keep the point on the other man. A Japanese sword, you keep the hilt straight and move the tip. That's right. And a Chinese sword is in between the two. Now, which one do you want? Which, exactly. which one suits the physics of the lightsaber? If you haven't worked out the physics of the lightsaber, how do you even begin to make that decision? Maybe it can support all three. I don't know. In which case, maybe there's different sort of forms. And going into the, into the Star Wars world, what's interesting about that is then you have, you know, if we were to philosophize about it, well, first of all, even taking it to the films itself, nobody was doing fights uh, predominantly with just as you say, the flashlight. 
there was some form of a blade attached. So even from an actor's or a performer's stunt person's mm. perspective, there was an added weight regardless. So how they move affects their biomechanics That's right. as opposed to just, just do this and we'll put something in. Mm. So if they did that, the fighting would be even so much more different. It would look entirely different. So we have to compensate for the fact that they had mm. something there. So I have been a big believer in a gyroscopic uh, mm. feeling in the blade to really to to give it that a uh, mm. better illusion and effect. And, and then also consider how readily can a lightsaber slice through stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sometimes it's just boom, and no matter what titanium people spaceships doesn't matter just right through with a one hand or two you know two finger flick and you can just go through anything but that's not consistent qui-gon is cutting through a door he's exerting mm. effort yes two more layers of door so shut, there's a resistance stopped. Mm. that's right luke lands a glancing blow on vader's pauldron right yes doesn't go through right there's a grunt as oh but he doesn't drop his arm off right <laughs> yeah, so, the best. so so you need to put some force into the blow. There That's is right. resistance. You still have to land a cut, you know. And this is no offence to, to, to kendo people, but kendo by necessity lands a shinai on an armoured target and, and, and ends. Right. And, right. and a through. real sword obviously and slices into and the wing continues yeah, to slice right through. through. Right. right. And that's so where we a get cutting yes. action. And, and so, you know, do you want it to look like you're actually cutting through some material? And some materials are harder than others. Right. You know, there's, there's, if you look at um, later episodes of Rebels and now into, like, uh, Jedi Fallen Order and stuff like that, uh, and, and I quite like the swordsmanship in those, but they're getting towards a lot of one-handed. It's, it's, it's evolving into a Western mm. saber. It is. Western it is. saber yes. doesn't cut through anything <laughs> on a whim. Yes, no. it's like the Hutton style of, of swordplay, right? Mm. Exactly. Um, and what's fascinating too, I find, is even like, again, uh, historically, you know, with the Graflex, and I have a replica, you've got the real Graflex you were showing me earlier, I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, when you have the switch box here, even holding it, I find is like, oh my goodness. Mm. And as a, as a swords person, and again, I know that we, the, the you know, here's the, bringing of course a shinai into it um mm. again the length of the handle so for me as a, as a martial artist i'm so used to a nice long grip that i found in terms of fighting style i find a a, a blade or a handle like this on this type of a saber so much more akin to proper you know my style of kendo fighting and this also in terms of spinning Exactly. Yeah. And because of this balance point, in terms of spinning, I find these types of sabers are so yeah. much more akin to, you know, if you want the flashy spinning moves, this is yeah. way more effective than something like this to get when the effect. That's much customizing. closer to a Japanese sword hilt. Yes. Very exactly. Very right? When, when, Very much. When I started building my own props, I mean, he's, he's an original Graflex by comparison. When I started <laughs> building my own, Okay. You can right. Right. <laughs> so, so I actually came up with about three sort of vaguely steampunky, you know, mm -hmm. rationalization was that this is an earlier technology. You know, right. The, 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 I quite like this one as well. This one's rather cute. And, oh my and gosh. Enormous. Wow. That's and, the biggest sonic screwdriver I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then of course, as the technology improves and they develop the Highland emitter, um mm. so this is like a like a grand the highland emitter. No, right. no, no, that's yes. the brand. That's the brand. Oh right, right. Okay, the high okay. The uh the 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 uh most of them are uh Graflex, uh but uh, the, the Vader the Vader is a Highland brand um camera. Uh I, I spent years chasing these things down. See, I immediately go to Highlander, so that's where my fight director <laughs> mind goes. I'm like A-T-I-L-A-N-D, oh. yeah, no, diff a different word. A totally different. A different I've time. got the, the hilt I use for Saber Guild with me. And right. um, it's, this is a, it's a custom by somebody up in Washington, Shea Whitmer, um, who's also a fencer. Um, and what he has is he has a big, heavy pommel for us back here. So like when it doesn't have the mm -hmm. blade in it, it's kind of heavy in one way, but it really, he balances these so well. Um, and the, you know, smooth, 
you know, yeah. the, the, the on off switch is just a little tiny button here. Cause yeah, if you're going to be doing any kind of spinny stuff, that mm -hmm. that Graflex box is not going to help you. <laughs> well, you need, you no. need to figure out where, where is that going to go in, mm -hmm. in your grip, you know, cause you're going to have a V in your thumb and forefinger. So I, I tend to put the activation box between my thumb and forefinger and on, on a classic Graflex, that actually leaves, if you want to use the red button, that leaves the red button available here. Right. But it also leaves the, the uh, activation switch there. But on the set at, on AOTC, what they had Aiden and I and the others using were cast resin replicas of original mm. and some prequel designs. And there was just heaps of them. They were cast with about a one... What would you say, AJ? No, almost a centimetre thick uh, steel yes. thread yeah, the, coming the, out. The, um, the, 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 the pink on that the pink, hex nut. Uh, yeah. 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 But the handles they, were, were, they, they were never more than about 10 or 12 inches long and never more than about two inches diameter. Probably. They were yeah. Yeah, a little under. But of those, there were numerous of them. And the one that I found most comfortable, I don't own a copy of it, but if you look at a, a, like a mall staff, there was a lightsaber that was essentially like <clears throat> half a mall staff with mm. this emitter lacking the last little bit here. So it kind of tapered down a little. And that was actually the base. That was the pommel mm. and the blade came out from here. And I think, I think it was Eith Koff, the other, the other, um, the other uh, uh, person of mall species, um, but without the tats. Uh, I, th I think it was his saber, but but that one I actually found the most comfortable because it was the most round. But if I was building a lightsaber for real, if it was possible, I would I would actually put a taper, you know, I would put a an oval profile mm. on it so the thing is indexed, even though you don't have a cutting angle, just just, mm -hmm. just for control, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's where I find I like this, where I have a bit of. For my my and again it gives me a bit of counterweight as well like when i when i fight well, so this is, this is why i quite like the obi-wan or or the um or the jedi luke because they have because of the bell emitter uh and because of the the uh, german um hand grenade stuff that they built this out of you've actually got some very deep grooving here and you mm. can actually you know you can get a finger in there you know and actually have a a decent one-handed grip on that Plus, it's got quite a nice pommel, so you've got something you can actually, you know, seat your bottom hand on, and something you can actually hook your your front finger into. So I, I really like the Kenobi saber; it's it's always been my favourite. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I love you know this this scene. I love seeing the blades, Catherine. That's a fantastic. That's a good fighting sword too. That, that yeah. you the hilt that you showed. Yeah. Um, and and again too, this is interesting because you know, as a, you know, being part of a, a cosplay um, and costuming groups like with Rebel Legion, um, you know, there's a lot of people with various different skills and you know mindsets when it comes to the weaponry. But it's interesting. I always find even in the fantasy setting, like you know, working on other shows, it's I always find finding that grounding in the history or the reality because all bladed weapons are going to work within a certain sort of way. And um, even like the idea of this whole world or, or this universe of different temples with the Jedi, there's where we can have different styles of fighting. So you can have something more akin to the Japanese styles or different uh, Chinese or Indonesian or Filipino or Western martial arts styles, depending on the temples. So I think that's kind of fascinating. There's a potential within the Star Wars universe to showcase um, just like historically, well, you know. Well, consider, you know, even the katana, the, the design of the katana is relatively standard, relatively mm -hmm. standard for a medieval technology. And yet there are hundreds, there were hundreds of schools with significant differences in cutting style, gripping style. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they called them ruha. Uh, ru is traditional flow and ha is oh. faction. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, what, what, what was it, Aiden? About 300 extant Ryuha? Uh, there are 300 extant. There were at least 3,000 yeah. um, catalogued um, yeah. in about six or seven different super groups. But, uh, but yeah, and each of them has a distinctive, do they pull mm -hmm. down and rotate over, sort of clubbing like an axe? Do they, do they roll they out through? and slash? Do that, yes. Um, 
Roll the or, two. Or, or, uh, yep. It, Definitely. Yeah, and each one works better against something. <laughs> exactly. Can I, can, I, can I cast a vote against the seven forms? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 the prequel fight director did have a concept of levels. He, he, he's, he, he had nine levels, as he has said, but he, he describes them more. He didn't appear to have named them. He described them as levels. So I think of them as being something like Dan grades in a martial arts system, you know, show done, right. done, done. Um, Mike Stackpole, when he wrote I Jedi, which was a, a, a watershed book, truly, it was fascinating. Um, but he spoke with an Olympic fencer and they came they derived the you know makashi Suresu, shicho i can't even remember them all and they've since been turned they've since been interpreted and and you can find you know descriptors in schools and colleges and things and essentially from what i can see most of them someone has said okay here is one that is like a rapier here is one that is like a chinese dao here is one that is like uh, you know this that or the other um, and you know, okay, that's cool, that's fine, but but you're not you're not stuck to that. And 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 Mr. Gillard didn't maintain that you were stuck to anything like that. Um, it's a good starting point, but I yeah. think I think things should be more. I like the idea of someone maybe if you're going to develop, you know, pretend real martial systems, then have them internally consistent well, all means, because that's half the fun. And and it's a lot of fun too when you put two different styles against each other. Mm. And again, as a fight director, I always love uh, whenever I have the license. And again, under pressures of producers and directors, sometimes you're told just to put something together. And that's where you get the old, the belly slice that kills everybody. And it's like, really? Here we go. And belly slice, you know, and they're wearing a curious. It doesn't matter. They're dead. It's through the chain mail. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it just, you go, oh, and you go, oh, please. And then you have to kind of defend yourself later on going, it was what they wanted. Um, but what's really fascinating too, is again, that the, the time constraints is sometimes, you know, just having a set number of systems going this is, you know, your sequence. This is your sequence. Again, depending on what the demands are. But when it's what I find exciting as a fight director and watching as a, you know, as as a movie buff and and a, and in and even theater, is when I see or I get to do things where I have two opposing styles, and you get to see the different schools working against each other. And that's, you know, and I, I even, I had the luxury and I like to brag about it because it was a great experience, but I got to work with Bob Anderson. And that's the main reason I became a fight director. Of course, the guy that did the Princess Bride and did the Star Wars original trilogy fights, um, such a great um, knowledge of information and a historical figure and to be able to have worked with him. And I asked him about um, the Princess Bride fights because they're fun and they weren't, you know, um, you know, you could argue they weren't historically accurate, but they were really hearkening back to that golden age of film, to the swashbuckling age. But it did it, he did it in a way that was so clean that allowed the audience to stay with the journey as it went on. And you could tell when they had these two equals fighting that there was more than just blades being swung. There was actually uh, one upmanship happening between them. And I love that from a historical point of view, especially when they start talking about Benetti's defense, Capafiro. Right, and I just love that. Oh, you're using Benetti against me, right? I just like, oh my god, the Agrippa cancels up, exactly. Yes, Unless he studied his Agrippa, which I have. <laughs> so, um, but what's fascinating about that too is what you were saying. These masters, they had their own schools and their own kill moves, or this is the only way. And there were moves where you could actually have the best way to defeat a Spaniard. Right, it's just like, and and I was looking into that as a as a nerd, the nerd that I am, and there was a thing called, of course, the Spanish Circle or the Magic yes. Circle, yes. which for yes. two hundred years Christy they Quincy. could not understand how you could, you know, that Spaniards were considered the best fighters, and they had this mysterious knowledge, but when you break it down historically, and and again, this relates to Star Wars and that too, and you think about the different battles and how the worlds were decimated and how a civilization recovers. With Spain, having gone through the Inquisition and being aware of how the body functions and having more exposure to it than other cultures in Europe because of what was left behind from the Inquisitors, 
uh, of how, you know, to heal a body after it's been ripped open and to, to help heal these people. Spanish had this interesting knowledge um, of, of how, what could kill, what could actually not kill. So bringing that into their fencing and fighting schools, that's what made Spanish people, uh, the Spanish fighters, so fierce is they had this innate, they had this knowledge that was passed down to them from having survived the Inquisition. And that's what, you know, like, that I find fascinating. And you can bring that into the Star Wars culture, any universe uh, out there, when you think about a civilization that's been decimated and what they saw and how they historically, how they recover from it. So you have like different temples, you know, in, in the Star Wars universe, you know, near extinct, they saw these horrors and they know now from that, ex that horrific knowledge of how to develop that in their skill set to not let it happen again or how to ensure that they can survive the next time. May I offer a, a meta comment that, you know, it's often said the art of screenplay is the art of characterization and the arc of character development. But when, you, when you're dealing with a, a fantasy or sci-fi world, the world itself is a character. And world building is is paramount. Mm. It is absolute. You know, go to these, you know, with any of these movies, Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, it doesn't matter. People go to these movies to escape. You know, for a couple of hours, they're in a big dark room and, they, you know, they, they don't mm -hmm. even remember where they park their car. I'm somewhere else for a while. You know, take yeah. me somewhere yeah. else. And they want consistent world building. Mm. And the same, the same with reading a good sci-fi novel, you know, Ian, Ian Banks' culture novels, you know, that sort of thing. You want solid, consistent world building. You don't want the rules to be broken because that instantly takes you out you know, and you're back in the car park wondering where the car keys are and you're not enjoying your, your $30 movie and popcorn. Um, and, you know, it's the highest sin in, in my mind. It's the highest sin of a, of, of a creative industry not to have spent the time in world building, not to have spent the time to ensure mm. consistency of the physical modelling of how things are supposed to work. Don't say that, Travelling at light speed takes two seconds in one scene and takes a fortnight in the next scene. You know, pick, uh, my, my, pick one. Pick one. Pick mm -hmm. a bloody lane and stick to it, please. <laughs> and you know. and, and it's, it's fascinating with that, too, because they really describe that in a lot of the uh, the novels about you know, how hyperspace works and how, you know, it, which is it's interesting that they're now creating the reason and explaining why this is this way. And that's like an example is like Rogue One explaining why in a new hope it's just like a little like boop, two meter mm. section boop, blow up spoilers oops. a reference to time dilation yes <laughs> right you know last but, I, you know it's uh, yeah it's, it's it's all very fascinating and it's important um uh, for the creatives to create as you said this something that we can follow and you mentioned like with potter as well and again as a fight director when i watch the wand fights it's fencing Yes. And then you describe that to people who, you know, have a wand and they're just doing stuff. And it's like, you know, there's a technique to that. And they go, <laughs> what? And I actually was able, as I also teach at a university a couple of years ago, I did the Scottish play. I set it in a wizarding world. So their fights were all done with wands and they would actually attack. But and, and Perry not making contact, but also, but it was really effective because when you have an attack and then a counterattack or a riposte, and you're doing that with the wants, it gives it this real sense of, um, you can follow what's happening. So it's not just like, you know, spell after spell. So lay on and duff and Dan be he versus he versus first 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 expelliences, first. expelliences or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot of fun, you know. Um, Catherine, um, I'm see here. I, I'm talking about fights. Here I am and no, nerding out. Question for failing Aiden. to keep us on topic. <laughs> Which Aiden, I, I have a question for you. Things, but I'm lost. So, so Aiden, you with uh, having latex and prosthetics. Mm. Now, as a fighter, I've had to work in prosthetics before, and there are horrors. And with having to fight as a costume, you know, a cosplayer, there are horrors in some of these costumes. Even being around children, getting a photo that you cannot see below here. You have to be very careful about droids and children and porgs <laughs> at your feet. 
Um, so did you find, again, with also with rubber hands, uh, the three what fingers, was it like? the three fingers meant that we were all holding our, holding our lightsabers like this. There was no room for, um, elegant, whatever, because most species, we were all equipped with the same hands. Platoonians, Barada, Nick too, we all had the same hands. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, and the fact that the lightsabers were of the small persuasion actually made it worse <laughs> for the right. waving them around. Whereas um, I've got to be honest, it was just a scorching hot period of time in Sydney when we were doing it, and we were overheating. Um, so actually, you had to take off. I think pretty much all of the um, rubber heads, we had to take off the over robe and did all of our um, more detailed work um, within the lighter colored um, shirt and belt rather than um, fully, fully uh, cloaked. Uh, the only thing I've, uh, yeah, actually, if it wasn't for the um, extras photo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't remember that I actually had the big rope because the first thing, we did was go in and take it off and fold it up <laughs> and put it down there because it 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 was that that's the main memory of it was this yes and there were of did course you, did you get the blow up and shining masks these were episode these were new hope masks so, <laughs> so they were they had been well worn oh, by God. others before how is that latex standing up oh. after all those years <laughs> oh well so uh yeah i was missing part of the tooth and, uh, uh, but otherwise my mask was in good condition. They had obviously been well looked after, but, uh, but. Well, uh, may have been yeah. new ones spun off an old mold, possibly. Oh. Yeah. But, but the makeup people who were putting it on them said that they were, the, they were actually just recycled. <laughs> oh my gosh. This, um, many years ago, there was a series I worked on called Voyage of the Unicorn and we were trolls and all the stunt people we had, we had our, our, our stuff was made for us. But I remember you just brought back this memory. There was a, a rubber made bin of troll masks. <laughs> and for the poor, I feel bad for the poor background people because they come in for a day and they'd be, and this is like in the summertime, 30 degree heat Celsius. Um, so uh, they would bring up the tub for the background performers and they just pull out a mask. And they basically slap these like masks and they're, you know, they're tight fitting because they have to like, and the mm. stench. And at the end of the day, they would just air them out. <laughs> and, and, and of course, in the, in the Star Wars clubs, you know, uh, long con days, you know, it's the same feeling when you have people in, you know, um, plastic and rubber and leather change rooms are not the most pleasant smelling things. So, and I always <laughs> thought about that afterwards about people who didn't come back and then their mask was then recycled on someone else. And I just, and it would be still wet. I still remember my own mask going in back into the chair and it being wet. And I felt slightly grossed out about it. Or <laughs> sometimes even with my own kit, when I'm doing something and I have maybe there's two events in the day and you sweat in the first event. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, later, the, the, the old... talcum powder, the, <laughs> the latex, and then the air blower to try and cool you down one well, of my first the premiere Legion of events. phantom menace in a in a full darth maul head that i'd made for myself and I, I stupidly kept it on through the whole movie and that that was just no that was that was bad one of my first legion events was a convention and i'll never forget um somebody there had a plo Koon costume and he comes back to our changing room and he pulls the head off and just holds it over a garbage can while the sweat drains out like a brass player emptying their spit valve. <laughs> and I watched that and it was like my third event or something like that. And I was like, wow, I'm never oh. doing a mask like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what your second nose was for, right? Yes. <laughs> it was well, at least I had an air hole. <laughs> there were two little air holes in that. Actually, and that's to, a great place to, to actually air out too, right? To so. let the hot air rise, yes. So I don't know what the yeah. poor um, weak and <laughs> whatever we're doing, their heads were much heavier. Yeah, oh. mine was just skin uh, skin tight, but uh, but the ones but I didn't have uh, eight hundred uh, pounds of of uh, tentacle and things hanging off the top. That uh, right. would have been. Uh, 
I should... kept popping off too, by the way. I, I remember watching him do a cut and a couple of tentacles sort of flew off of it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Kit Fisto. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it's so. it's really interesting too because uh, I, I hands off to you know um, fellow costumers as well because it's amazing to see something on screen and then to replicate it and to make even a better version of what you know has been seen and 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 also to being able to play in the film world. And then, you know, in the cosplay world, I find it really interesting how people will say, this is what it was. And there's, of course, you know, the big controversy is like, you know, Han Solo's uh, parka and Empire Strikes Back. Mm. Is it brown or is it blue? You know, and it's like these two camps. But it's amazing how, unless you work on a film set and with, you know, the lighting and the types of lighting and the mm. color correction, even on the day, how that can change the entire look. And I remember, you know, I remember going to places going, that's not what they used because it looks so different. Go, yeah, it sure was what they used. Put it under this circumstance, under these lights, in that condition with this DP or director of photography, that's how it's going to look. So blue can look brown and brown can look blue. Mm. You know? Or or when I'm just being dying on screen type thing <laughs> in a gray haze, it looks like my, my um, undershirt under garment is is sort of dark gray or dark brownish but it was actually tan a light tan <laughs> there, right it's uh, it's there's just a it was just it was just there was so much they were using so much blur and so much um uh smoke effect uh in in post-production uh that uh, it completely changed the color of the uh costume from uh, what it was out in the real world <laughs> You know, it, uh, it's so incredible how that works, you know, and mm -hmm. then even even the um, types of fabric that are used can read so differently, you know, like when you look at the, um, the way something flows or holds, and then you try to, you know, you find the exact or you look for the what you think is the exact fabric, and it can be completely off, you know, and, and I always find even the Darth Maul's outermost robe, uh, it, it, I believe was actually almost knitted. It was a really coarse fabric, you know, it had a mm. little texture to it. Bloody mm -hmm. heavy too, I would imagine. Right, yeah. And that's even finding the right flow, like for the mm. of wool, you know, the white weight of wool for it to, to billow. And it's just, it's just amazing how to, all those things that come together in, in, in making, making magic. You know, mm. it's, a, it's a force to be believed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just dropping. I'm. <laughs> um, but he's uh, starting to wake up. It's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Coffee's finally kicking in. Um, so, Catherine, is there anything else that you'd like to to ask um, Bob or Aiden? I think we've covered everything. Yeah. I mean, there's awesome. so much more. I mean, I, just, I, I yeah, I know. Like we, we could go. We could go for hours. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, well, thank you guys so much. Um, this has definitely been, you know, I think I was in like middle school when I, you know, saw on some like featurette or something that was like, oh yeah, you know, like we pulled Jedi extras from these kendo clubs. And I was just like jealous. Um, so <laughs> thanks for taking the time to talk also, to us. Also, less to be jealous of than you might have thought, sadly. <laughs> yeah. I still think it would have been awesome. And also too, I just like to say to you, Robert and Aiden um, as well, you know, thank you so much. I mean, uh, the Rebelthon Strikes Back is to really um, help UNICEF, which is a great organization. Uh, and as we know, um, UNICEF means every child everywhere. And so it's it's a, it's always I I always find uh, causes to help raise uh, money for uh, children in need in disaster areas, war zones, uh, suffering disease and devastation. Uh, it's a great cause. So I really do appreciate you being up so late uh, to talk to Catherine and myself so early for us. Um, <laughs> As we are now going into your day. Now, you've already lived the day. You can tell us what happens because we're just about yeah. to yes. live this yes. day. Never forget yeah. we're from the future. Yeah, that's yes. right. We are from 17 hours in the future. <laughs> but seriously, please give generous racing results. Life's like them. <laughs> yeah. So, again, thank you so much. It's for a great cause, and we do appreciate your time. And uh, I'm looking forward to having more of these types of conversations with you offline. So,
Thank you so much. Oh, you need a very long piece of string with two baked beans. <laughs> yes, I can. Yes, Text exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, tins yeah. of marmite. Veggie mite. Veggie mite. Sorry. <laughs> Oh. Oh. All right, I'm just going to stop that right there. Everyone, please donate to UNICEF. Thank you so much for joining us. And here's back to Rebelthon. <laughs>